Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. That was quite a crowd, Norman. I have to say, it's bigger than in Tromsø yesterday, but uh, I think they are friendly. They look quite nice. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming to Oslo. You've had a very busy schedule. You've been to Bergen, and yesterday you were probably in the northernmost place you've ever been, Tromsø, and you had two appearances with uh, very good discussions. And now we have traveled all the way down to Oslo, and we are incredibly happy to see you and very thankful that you take the time to share with us. So, welcome to Oslo, and I think we give uh, Finkelstein a, a good hand. Are you tired? Are you gentle? No, I'm fine. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good you came in the winter time when it's not 24 hour light because then it's even harder to sleep. Um, we are going to talk about your latest book, um, but first of all, before we do that, I'd like to um, ask you a little bit about your background as um, an atheist, uh, an old Maoist, and a Jew, coming from a family who had a very painful history during the Holocaust. Can you give us a little bit of your family history, Norman? Well, before I go into that, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out this evening. And even though I do not lack in an ego, I must say that what I find encouraging this evening is that sometimes one gets the feeling that the Palestine cause has died, that it's been replaced by all the human humanitarian catastrophes in the Arab world, whether it be Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, of course Syria, Libya, uh, Egypt, and yet despite it all, and despite a very painful period in the Palestinian struggle, one can say, judging from this evening, that despite it all, the cause still lives. And that's a very hopeful sign for me. And whatever happens in the course of the evening, it's the image that I will take home with me, that it's not futile, it's not hopeless, that people still care, and uh, that's very encouraging. So I'm glad, not for my ego, but for the sake of the people of Palestine, and also for so many people who have devoted such a large part of their lives to the cause, that it's still alive. And not to sound a cliche, but so long as people care, there's rational grounds for hope. Once people stop caring, it's very hard to be optimistic. But with this number of people, uh, and I wish the people of Gaza could see who's here, that so many people so far away still care that for them and for us, there is rational grounds for hope. So thank you for being here. Uh, my family history can be summarized fairly simply. Both of my parents were from Warsaw, Poland and my parents lived a good middle-class life. My mother had an excellent education. She was quite talented in math, but also knew languages, knew Latin, and also was cultured in the old-fashioned European sense, classical music. Uh, she was very impressive. And then suddenly, as if in the blink of an eye, 
the world turned upside down. And from living a cultured, carefree, beautiful youth, she suddenly, as it were, in the blink of an eye, found herself in the Warsaw Ghetto, and she was reduced to vermin. All around her, people were literally, not figuratively, literally, starving to death. Their bodies were just in the street, and each day somebody would come around in a wagon to pick them up. And from there on, both my parents were in the Warsaw Ghetto until 1943, April 1943. After the Nazis repressed the uprising, the survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto, of which there were about 20 to 30,000, were deported to Majdanek concentration camp. My mother then ended up in two slave labor camps. My father ended up in Auschwitz and in the Auschwitz death march. And by the war's end, some of you may know the uh, radio and television personality Amy Goodman from Democracy Now! And she once interviewed my mother and asked her, so, how did you feel when the war was over, the day you were liberated? She was liberated by the Red Army, the Soviet Red Army. She said, how did I feel? It was the worst day of my life. And I remember Amy Goodman had this very puzzled look on her face. The worst day of your life, the day you were liberated, how come? And my mother said, because the whole of the war, her mind was focused how to survive, how to survive, what to do. Should you turn left? Should you turn right? Should you agree or should you disagree? What to do? What to do? What to do? It's the only way to survive. You have to be mentally very focused. And now the war was over and it suddenly dawned uh, on her that uh, she was the only one left in the world. Her entire family um, had been exterminated and then the whole reality caved in on her. And the truth be told, neither my mother nor my father ever, uh, ever let go of it uh, to the last days. So I lived in that family and uh, it was tough. Thank you, Norman. Uh, it's a very uh, chilling and unmoving uh, family history. Uh, I, I'm out of words to... Uh... I would just want to add in respect, on my father's side, every single member was killed too. Uh, there were just five people in the world. Myself, my two siblings, and my parents. We never had any relatives, no aunts, no uncles, no cousins, uh, no uh, grandparents. Um, my father was much less articulate about what happened, but neither of them ever, ever uttered the word, one word, about what happened to their family. I have no idea. They would never talk about it. And um, the main lesson I learned from my parents, uh, just to give you an anecdote, in my community where I was growing up, they were going to build a homeless shelter. And the neighborhood was very angry because if you build a homeless shelter, the value of your property goes down. 
and everyone, including my parents, were very conscious about what were called property values. You build a shelter, property values are going to go down because those people are going to come live in our neighborhood. And I was very surprised because my mother was very conscious of property values. She said, build the shelter. And she was very insistent to build the shelter. And I asked her why, because I was surprised. And she said, because you will never, you never know where you'll be tomorrow. And I knew exactly what she was talking about. She went from the Polish middle class to a concentration camp in the blink of an eye. You never know where you'll be tomorrow. And I took that with me. Don't ever look down on anybody else's suffering because you never know where you'll be tomorrow. So we wrote a number of books on Palestine and a number of books on Zionism and the last book that we are going to discuss today is the book that you just released this year on Gaza. Before we go into the details, I'd just like to quote and a little bit of follow up to what you've just been telling now, uh, your introductory uh, quotation and the last quotation. You open up with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. And I'll read it. The massacre of innocent people is a serious matter. It is not a thing to be easily forgotten. It is our duty to cherish their memory. And you end the book with a quote from Confucius who says, The beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper name. Why did you choose these two quotations? Well... Um, when I was writing the book, I was pretty hopeless about the situation among the Palestinians in general and among the people of Gaza in particular. I was hopeless on a political level. The cause seemed to be dying. And I had my unpredictable circumstance had ended up my entire adult life devoted to the cause. People often would criticize me and say I'm obsessed with Palestine and as if to say there was some anti-Semitic or self-hating motive. Said, That's really not true. It's just that the cause never ended. And I'm not a quitter. You don't walk away from a suffering people because it's no longer fun or because you want to do something new. The people there don't have the choice to walk away. And if they don't have the choice, then morally, I don't have the choice. And I have some good friends there who I made over the years and I didn't think I could ever face them by telling them, well, you know what? I got bored with Palestine. I decided to do something new. So I stuck to it, but I was kind of hopeless. Nonetheless, even in my hopelessness, I do believe that you have an obligation to the dead and to those who have suffered to remember, to record what was done to them. You may not be able to bring them back from the dead and you may not even be able to diminish the suffering of the living. But it's certainly within your power to remember, to record for history what was done. And um, so that was 
the inspiration. And when it came to dedicating the book, the dedication was very simple. It says, to Gaza dash the truth. Because I felt very confident I made every effort humanly possible with all the limitations of being a human being, namely being fallible and not able to achieve absolute perfection. But I made every effort to record the truth. There is no exaggeration. There's no need to exaggerate because the truth is so terrible and it's so appallingly heartless what's being done to those people and the indifference has become or reached a level of criminality I don't want to anticipate where we're going this evening but one fact stands out in terms of the criminality of the indifference all the major UN human rights humanitarian organizations have been saying for the last six years that Gaza is quickly reaching the point of being unlivable. And now, as we speak, literally as we speak, there are reports daily coming out, not just from Gaza, and not just from the UN, but the reports are coming out from Israeli military and political officials that Gaza is reaching the point of complete and total collapse which is to say when they were saying will Gaza be unlivable in 2020 that's what the UN reports were originally saying when they came out around 2012 and they gradually moved up the date they said, maybe not 2020, it may be sooner than 2020. Well, the future is now upon us. The point that the UN agencies were predicting is now, as we speak, upon us. Gaza is imploding. It is collapsing. That is not poetry. That is not hyperbole. That is fact, as acknowledged, as I said, by the Israelis themselves. And Gaza has, I don't want to pretend it's worse than other conflicts in the world. Syria is a nightmare, Afghanistan is a nightmare, Yemen is a nightmare, and I'm not going to compare. But Gaza has, let's just call it, a unique feature. The unique feature is, as UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, put it, they said in other parts of the world, when there's a natural disaster, let's say a drought, or there is a armed conflict, say Syria, they said in every other part of the world, where there are disasters which are either natural or human-made, the people at least have the option of fleeing. That's why there is a massive refugee problem. Millions of Afghanis fled. Millions of Syrians have fled. Gaza has the unique characteristic of they can't leave. They are literally caged in as Gaza quickly becomes, or is now, unlivable. Now, I'm not going to attach a technical label to how you want to describe that situation, 
I don't want to get involved in a silly, semantical, legal dispute about whether it constitutes genocide or not. When you cage a people in an area, knowing full well that it is, as a medical, biological fact, unlivable. And that's what we're confronting now. And I have no doubt that if you had caged one million chimpanzees or dogs, one million chimpanzees or dogs in an area that was unlivable, there would be more protests than there are for the one million children in Gaza. Gaza is over 50% children under the age of 18. You would have more outrage over enclosing chimps in an unlivable situation than you have for the children of Gaza. That is criminal. was also asked why I called it Confucius when he said the beginning of wisdom is naming things by their proper name. When I was thinking about the book that I had written, it occurred to me that most of what I wrote was simply trying to find the correct terms for what was going on there. The first and most important term, the one we have to eliminate, the one we have to refuse to use, there has never been a war in Gaza. Israel has never had military objectives in Gaza. Israel has never targeted combatants in Gaza. Israel has never targeted military sites in Gaza. What you have in Gaza is the systematic, methodical, targeting of the civilian population. It has never been, except in the most marginal circumstances, it's never been a war. And therefore, all the terminology that's used, even in criticizing Israel, even in the criticism of Israel, the terminology has been Israeli propaganda. So they'll tell you, yes, Israel used disproportionate force. Disproportionate force is, let's say, you're targeting a combatant, and in order to kill the combatant, you dropped a one-ton bomb. So that's called disproportionate force. Or they'll tell you, Israel used indiscriminate force. Namely, it was targeting a, a combatant, but it used a weapon which killed all the people around the combatant because the weapon was not precise. So it's indiscriminate force. But all this terminology, disproportionate force, indiscriminate force, it assumes, it presupposes that you are targeting combatants. But Israel doesn't target combatants. At the risk of even 
evoking the anger of Mats, I have to insist there were no combatants. There was no war. Each time Israel invaded Gaza, it was targeting the civilian population. As the Goldstone report, the report by Richard Goldstone, after Operation Cast Lead said, the objective of Israel was to punish, humiliate, and terrorize the civilian population. That's not a war. If your target is the civilian population, that's a crime against humanity. It's not a war. And most of the book went, is devoted to showing all the terminology, all the language, all the facts, all the claims. They're just false. And in large numbers of cases, they are simply fabricated by the Israeli propaganda machine and the human rights organizations, including the human rights organizations, they're too cowardly to do what Confucius says is the beginning of all wisdom, but it's also the beginning of all truth. And that is to call things by their proper names. Israel is not using indiscriminate force, it's not using disproportionate force. Israel is committing a colossal crime against humanity, against a population that's overwhelmingly refugees, 70%, and a majority children, 51%. That's the reality. Everything else is just repeating, maybe not intentionally, but repeating Israeli propaganda. Uh, in your book you have um, four different sections. The first section is on Operation Castlet, which was December uh, 2008 to January 2009, Operation Stöpteblü which uh, engaged lots and lots of people in Norway, by the way. The second part is about the Goldstone Report. The third part is about the Mavi Marmara incident, or attack. And the last part, which we will go into uh, more details on tonight, is uh, the part about the last attack, 2014, 51 days of attack on onslaught called Operation Protective Edge, and the last part is also about the uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, the ones who have been given the mandate to uh, be the watchdog of um, the international uh, laws, the human rights laws, and the regulations of uh, armed conflicts, the Geneva Convention. Um, namely, uh, you're in, in particular, you're analyzing the function of Amnesty International, and um, the UN Human the Rights UN, uh, the UN body of um, of uh, Human Rights Council, and you are extremely uh, detailed, accurate. I have to tell you, reading this book, it's more than 400 pages. You spend about mm, half an hour if you read it uh, closely on two pages. The number of footnotes per page or per chapter is um, three, four hundred for one of each parts of the book. This is a very scholar book and it's an absolutely invaluable source of documentation and knowledge. So I think, first of all, I, I would like to extend to you a deep food thank for having done this enormous undertaking to accumulate, to analyze, and to put together all this documentation. You have to read it. It is our duty to read it. Well, I Professor Chomsky is an old and dear friend and also a mentor and inspiration and many other things to me. And he's obviously up in age, he's 
89, which means that his body perhaps has another 10 years, his brain probably another 100 years. Uh, I know that when he's buried, the sand, the, the dirt above the grave is going to still be bouncing up and down from the palpitations of his brain. Uh, but uh, I gave him the book to read, and he started it on like a month, um, maybe a Saturday, and he was giving me updates, and then at the, around a week later, he said he finished the book, and I thought to myself, well, I know he read the book, because it took, it takes time, and even with his mental powers, uh, I knew it would take him a while. If he told me after two or three days he read it, I would think, no, he skimmed it. <laughs> but uh, he read it to the end, and I was very grateful for that fact. It was a gracious gesture from a person who at that age has better things to do with his time. And he even traveled to Gaza after 2014, and he had a seminar on... Uh uh, at, the at the the university, the Islamic University in Gaza, which was very successful, and uh, they still talk about it. You said that as we are speaking, Gaza is imploding. I totally uh, subscribe to that. I just came back from Gaza. Uh, the situation is extremely uh, precarious, very difficult. Uh, two days ago, a new report came out from Orcha. Uh, 17. Uh, excuse me, 19 hospitals and clinics are shutting down now because of lack of power. You know, there is a power crisis. The people of Gaza, 2 million people, average age, 17.6 years, as uh, you mentioned. They are supplied with electrical power between 3 and 4 hours a day. Of course, every institution handling medical um, problems, hospitals, um, care facilities and primary health care clinics, they are totally depending on generators. They don't have money to buy the fuel for the generators, nor is the fuel available. So, uh, as of this week, 19 hospitals and clinics are shutting down. 400 dialysis patients are threatened not to have their dialysis. Uh, the Shifa Hospital, which I know in depth, they closed down all emergency surgeries three weeks ago. And even for emergency, excuse me, they closed down all elective surgeries, all planned surgeries. Um, and even emergency surgeries are extremely um, um, hardly uh, prioritized in order to only operate those who are in life threatening situations. The number of patients who have been allowed to exit Gaza for medical treatment in Egypt, in Europe, or in Israel has decreased from um, the number of permits to leave Gaza uh, by the Israelis has decreased from 62% in 2016 to 54% in 2017, according to UN. That means that every second patient who needs, badly needs, cancer treatment, other types of medical treatment, are not allowed to exit Gaza. And you can imagine what kind of pressure it is on the medical system only three years after the last onslaught uh, which um, was calculated produced uh, nothing less than a thousand new multi-handicapped children just to mention one number and as our government is supporting the siege of Gaza our government is not protesting the closure of hospitals our government is supporting the U.S. politics towards the state of Israel. I think it is time to get organized and time to get moving because we are part of the problem. We are part of the responsibility for this situation. I just want to underline that. So are allowed to leave this meeting tonight without becoming a member, member of the Norwegian Palestine Committee. Uh, let's turn back to the book, uh, Norman. And uh, you have, you concentrate on two, or I would say there are two fundamental statements that I think you would describe as lies. Two things that we meet 
every time we discuss Gaza. The first one is that Israel has the right to defend itself. And the second is that Hamas has a huge arsenal of weapons, tunnels, and not at least deadly rockets. The third thing, which we will discuss later, is that any criticism of the State of Israel today and the politics of the State of Israel towards the Palestinians are now more and more often immediately stamped as anti-Semitism. But to those two first statements, Israel has the right to protect itself and Hamas is a deadly army. What would you uh, comment on that? Well, let's take the questions in reverse, because first we have to assess what exactly Hamas, what exactly is the threat that Hamas poses before we can ask the question, does Israel have the right to defend itself? Because if there's no threat, there's no need to, to defend yourself. So let's look at the facts. Whenever you look uh, at the major media, or even the human rights organizations, they always point or create, is there a problem? Okay. Uh, they always point or create this image of this vast, sinister, ominous Hamas arsenal of weapons. And they'll tell you about the Hamas, the Iranian Fajr 5 missiles and the Hamas um, Grad missiles and then they always have this inventory usually with these very ominous cleverly created graphics 20,000 of these rockets 15,000 of these missiles and it sends shivers down your spine as you look at these graphics and you look at these numbers. But then a simple question comes to mind if you look at this description rationally. The question is, where did they get these numbers? Because if you know the quality of the weapons, Grad missiles, Fajr 5 missiles from Iran, and if you know the quantity, you know the quality, you know the quantity, you must know where they are. Otherwise, how would you have these numbers? And then the question arises, we all know Israel is not shy about launching preemptive attacks. In fact, it's all the time launching preemptive attacks when nobody is going to attack them. So, if you know where the weapons are, as you must know because you know the quantity and the quality, then why doesn't Israel do what it does typically, for example, in Syria. Namely, it launches what it calls preemptive attacks against Syrian armed shipments to Hezbollah. That happens about every three weeks or so. There's another report. Why hasn't Israel preemptively attacked these weapons stashes by Hamas? It knows exactly how many they have. They know exactly the quality. Why haven't they preemptively attacked them? Exactly as it does every few weeks with Hezbollah. Are you going to try to convince me that Israel is embarrassed to launch a preemptive attack in Gaza? That's not very plausible. The only plausible exp explanation is they just pluck these numbers from thin air and they very gullible and complicit press and human rights community 
just repeats the numbers. Now, some of you rightfully will be thinking now, well, that's a, that's a plausible explanation, but he certainly hasn't proved anything. It still remains at the level of speculation. Okay, let's now move from the level of speculation, let's move to facts. And the facts I'm going to now recite to you come not from me, but they come from Israel. So according to Israel and some UN agencies monitoring the situation, during Operation Protective Edge from July 8th, uh, July 7th or 8th, 2014 till August 26th, Israel launched what are called 5,000 rockets. That's the official figure. 5,000 rockets. Hamas launched 5,000 rockets in Israel. That's the official figure. About 5,000 rockets at Israel. Israel, its Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it kept a daily diary on the web of all the uh, deaths and destruction by the Hamas rockets. Let's leave aside for a moment the question of civilian deaths, which came to six, but I want to leave that aside for a moment. Let's look at this, the physical destruction. I checked the website, I went through it carefully. In the 51 days, 5,000 rockets, one, one, one house was destroyed. One. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to ponder the question, how did it come to pass that 5,000 rockets only destroyed one house? That's awful perplexing. Well, if there were a supporter of Israel sitting in the audience and he or she were not a Mossad agent and it's unlikely there is anyone sitting in the audience who supports Israel except the Mossad agent at this evening's event he or she would probably at this point raise his or her hand vigorously and say, aha, Professor Finkelstein, I have caught you in your lie. It's unlikely they would have said Professor Finkelstein, they would have said Finkelstein, aha, I try to be factually accurate. Um, aha, I've caught you lying because you left out our brilliant anti-missile defense system, Iron Dome. And of course it is brilliant because Israelis created it, so by definition it has to be brilliant. So let's look at the Iron Dome. Iron Dome was only deployed around the major cities in Israel. According to the official numbers by Israel, 820 of the Hamas rockets came within the vicinity of Iron Dome, 820. Of those 820, Israel claims Iron Dome intercepted 90% or 740 of the 820 rockets. The top, one of the top anti-missile defense system experts in the world Theodore Postel at MIT, he examined the evidence and he said, well, I think it's closer to 5%. They probably intercepted about 40 rockets. But let's use the Israeli numbers. Let's use their numbers. 740. Okay. 
It doesn't take a rocket scientist to still ponder the question. That still means thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of rockets got through to Israel. 5,000 minus 720, using the Israeli figure, still leaves more than 4,000. How could only one house have been destroyed? In fact, 40% of the Hamas rockets, according to Israel, fell in the border area where Iron Dome wasn't even deployed. How could it be one house? Well, so far as I can tell, and I'm perfectly happy to entertain alternative explanations later this evening, the only explanation I can see is they weren't rockets. They were enhanced fireworks. Or as a writer in Foreign Affairs magazine described them, they were bottle rockets. There was no rocket attack by Hamas. Unfortunately, and I'm not here to criticize, I'm here strictly to look at the facts. Unfortunately, Hamas and Israel had a mutual interest, a mutual stake in pretending they were rockets. Israel, so it can claim it was acting in self-defense, and Hamas, so it can claim that its armed resistance was working. And so they created all of these videos for YouTube, which looked very ominous, with very sophisticated weapons, but unfortunately, not to be unfair, but the videos were more the product of a Hollywood studio than what was actually happening. If you look at the physical evidence, were there terror tunnels? It is true, Hamas and the people of Gaza constructed a very sophisticated, uh, complex tunnel system in Gaza, and also much less so, about 12 to 14 tunnels which went underneath the border into Israel. Now, I would never want to downplay, as a physical achievement, it was very impressive. Though I can't say I was altogether surprised, because as we know, four out of every three Palestinians is a civil engineer. And so there's also a very high rate of unemployment, so it's not surprising to me that very talented civil engineers who are unemployed found the time and their energy to construct a complex tunnel system. However, the claim was made that these tunnels were designed to target civilians, to kill as Prime Minister Netanyahu put it, to kill children, to attack kibbutzim. And I suspect, without knowing everyone in the room, of course, that overwhelmingly most of you believe that that was the purpose of the tunnels. In fact, over and over again, the Israelis acknowledged the tunnels were not used by militants to attack civilians. Never once, not one time, as the UN Human Rights Council report was probably 
one of two true statements in that report. It said all the information shows that the, tunnel, the militants entering the tunnels never targeted civilians. And the Israelis admitted it. What was the purpose of the tunnels? Before I get to it, there's an interesting question. Why did they admit it? Do you know why? Because Israel creates such a hysteria about these terror tunnels targeting civilians that the civilians living in the border area didn't want to come back because they were fearful that Hamas terrorists are going to pop out in the middle of the night in their bathroom. And so Israel had to acknowledge, no, they're not targeting you in order to get them to return. So there never were terror tunnels. The purpose, my guess, I can't prove it, but if I were to speculate, my guess was the tunnels were designed to try to capture a couple of Israeli soldiers as they did earlier with Gilad Shalit and then use them as a bargaining chip to get prisoners out of the Israeli jail, Palestinian detainees out of the jail. Now that I will acknowledge is speculation, that would be my guess. But there were never any attacks from those tunnels on civilians. And then it's an interesting fact, and I'll end there. The three main images that people retain, I dare say, the people in this room, aside from the massive death and destruction, which you will remember, the broad public doesn't know, the three main images that most people retain from Operation Protective Edge are Hamas rockets, terror tunnels, and Iron Dome. And now here is the story. There were no Hamas rockets, there were no terror tunnels, and there was no Iron Dome. It's all a fiction. A very effective propaganda machine. So much so that even those who thought they were looking at it critically internalized these images which were pure, total, complete fabrications. Yeah. I have to explain to you that Norwegian audiences very seldomly give applause in the middle of a speech. <laughs> Let alone giving standing ovations. That's very, we see it every day in the US Senate and so on. But this is unusual, so uh, you, have a, you have a good audience here. Let's, uh, time is running. Let's uh, turn to, the, um, to your criticism of the human rights organizations because most of us, and I would assume that some of you are members of uh, Amnesty International, and my father used to be an activist in Amnesty International. Um, I always thought of it as a neutral and very diligent um, and uh, justice-seeking organization. Um, I've seen uh, things in Gaza that have been pretty shocking when it comes to their actions in real situations. and. Um, one of the things that I remember very vividly from the last attack on Gaza was the ICRC representative in Gaza coming to Shifa um, in the middle of the bombing uh, with their white cars and big flags with red crosses on. And at that time, there had just been a bombing of the Mustashfa Mohammed al Durra, which was the pediatric hospital just north of Shifa, the al Durra hospital. Uh, we had had the, the bombing in the south of the hospitals, Al Quds hospital. The situation was extremely uh, dangerous for the healthcare personnel. Tenth and tenth of ambulances were, were shot at and bombed by the Israelis, altogether 47. Um, and uh, this representative came to have her daily update. And I said, the situation is extremely dangerous and we need you to make some very graphic and visual 
presentations of the international justice here and now. We urge you to place one ICRC vehicle with the flag outside every hospital in Gaza. To report, to document, but most of all to be a protection against the attacks on the hospitals and the clinics. The argument was very heated, I have to say, and her main um, reply was that they didn't have the manpower to do it. And I told her, then you just have to get some of these hundreds and hundreds of people in Geneva down here and place these vehicles in front of the hospitals. They never did it. After that meeting, she went down to the press tent where, where the media people were outside Shifa Hospital and she tried to inform the mostly Arab uh, group of journalists, all the other the Europeans were down in the beach hotel, and she almost got beaten up uh, out of anger with a lack, with a lack of action, with a lack of uh, protection from the international uh, agencies who are actually given the duty to uphold the Geneva Convention and to look to it that uh, civilians are protected and that healthcare uh, facilities are protected. They refused. Your criticism of Amnesty International and the UN is very harsh. Why? Uh, before I get to that, I feel a moral obligation and one which I want to exercise. There are many kinds of heroism in this world and one kind which leaves one awestruck, breathtaking, is the heroism of those people in Gaza who drive those ambulances. I have no concept, I can't conceive of the kind of courage that shows. Because each time you drive that ambulance, you are a target for an Israeli drone attack or a missile attack. And you know, because, not despite, but because you have the emblem of an ambulance on your vehicle, you become a target. Elsewhere one hopes, though that's a vanishing hope in large parts of the world, that being having the cross or the crescent is supposed to be a deterrent to an attack. But for certain and for sure, and I have no fear to say it in the camera's eye that because it's an ambulance, it's targeted in Gaza. And you saw repeatedly a family was murdered in its home, six, ten, fifteen members are extinguished an ambulance comes, the drones or the helicopters wait, and when the ambulance arrives on the scene, what's called the technical term, as Max knows, the first responders, immediately as they arrive on the scene, the missiles come and incinerate the ambulance. And then there are scenes described in the Human Rights Report of a second ambulance comes to rescue the people in the first ambulance. And the Israeli drones wait patiently until that second ambulance comes and then they target it with their drone missiles. How people find the courage to drive those ambulances, these vehicles of death. I don't know. I know Max is 
a courageous fellow. He's also a very good marathon jogger. <laughs> uh, which, You're envious. You're which envious. Is, yes, it's left me in awe, <laughs> not to mention envy. Um, and I know what he does is courageous. But I wonder, I don't know, would you have the courage to go in that ambulance? Can I reply to that? Yeah, I'd be question? curious. I wouldn't. Because now we're into the 2014 attack, and I, I in accordance with, uh, with you, Norman, I'll show a few pictures. Um, I think this, this one is a, a good illustration of what you just said in the beginning. This, this un un unbelievable situation of being completely imprisoned and then being bombed by the same people who occupy you and imprison you, and they deny you the right to flee. And this is a child ghetto, as you said. Uh, you started by talking about the Warsaw ghetto. What did people in the Warsaw ghetto do? What did they do? They resisted and they dug tunnels. What did they take through the tunnels? Arms, weapons and food. Just as the people of Gaza. Numbers matters. Um, I wonder, I want you to continue and you have an important story to tell. Mm. But I want facts to be clear. The Warsaw ghetto and all the talk of resistance, 90% of it is Hollywood movies. There was very little weapons. I remember my mother told me this story, that one person came down with a, a Kalashnikov, some fancy uh, World War II weapon, and they were shocked. A weapon? We have a weapon? The weapons are as fictional for the Warsaw Ghetto, as they are fictional for Gaza. But what you said, the other part, is true. The tunnels, strange coincidence. In the um, Warsaw Ghetto, like in Gaza, they had all of these, uh, a very sophisticated tunnel system. And I remember my mother told me the story. You had to dig it with your hands. How they did it, did it she doesn't know. And just like with the Palestinians, I'm afraid to say, and I hope I don't offend anyone, my mother was expressed shock. She said, Jews, the collaborators, as they were called, the collaborators, the couples, they would show the Nazis where the tunnels were, and they would show them where their own families were. So when you ever wonder about why we have so many traitors among us, in this case, Palestinians, every situation creates that class of scum, of human scum, who will even sell out their own mother and father to survive. And I'm not afraid to say that includes virtually the whole of the Palestinian leadership, pure, Total scum. Thank you. A few numbers from 2014 because we will dig a little bit more into it. These are the sum ups of the Israeli attacks on the UN shelters. These shelters were designated for the naked, unarmed civilian population to find some refugee, since they obviously couldn't fly. As you may know, there are absolutely no bomb shelters in Gaza because the Israelis have forbidden the Palestinians to build bomb shelters, and now there is no concrete there to build them. There is no air defense, there is no uh, operative civil defense, no early warning system, no sirens. So UN decided to make these schools um, shelters. They gave the coordinates to the Israeli commanders through the mechanism in Geneva and uh, the whole very complicated mechanisms. The Israeli commanders had the coordinates, the leplongs, 10, 15 times, and they targeted the shelters. They killed 47 civilians and injured four, 355 inside the UN shelters. You're Just to give you one example, of what they did with the shelters. They were targeting, they targeted uh, seven shelters. As Max pointed out yesterday, he didn't mention it now, 10, 15, 20 times, 
They sent the coordinates of the shelters, in particular the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross. It was telling the Israelis, these are civilian shelters, don't target them. These are civilian shelters. Well, at one point, Israel says we have to carry out an operation in this area. You have to evacuate the shelter. So, Palestinians, the Gazans in the shelter, they got scared. They gathered. The time was coordinated with Israel. They gathered in the courtyard of one of the shelters. They were converted schools, most of the shelters. They gathered in the courtyard. They were waiting for the bus to come to pick them up. What do you think Israel did? It targeted the people waiting in the courtyard with artillery shells. That's what happened. Once, twice, three, four, five times, Ban Ki-moon wouldn't open his mouth, the UN Secretary General. The sixth time he finally said something, the seventh time he heavily condemned it on August 3rd. After Ban Ki-moon condemned it, Obama didn't have any fig leaf anymore because now even the UN was condemning what Israel was doing or Ban Ki-moon, that comatose, I don't know. I've never seen someone like Ban Ki-moon. I don't know where that man came from, but he ought to go back. I've never seen anything like him. Do you know, a corpse that's been dead for a hundred years had more life than Ban Ki-moon. Well, after um, he condemned it, the United States had no fig leaf anymore. Obama couldn't hide behind the UN, and Obama condemned it. August 3rd, at Ban Ki-moon, then Obama. On August 2nd, Netanyahu said, I'm not leaving Gaza. I'm not leaving Gaza. After Ban Ki-moon in the morning, then Obama, what do you think? Netanyahu announced the ground war is over. It's very insightful because it shows you, everyone says, oh, Israel's out of control, Israel doesn't listen to anyone, Israel controls Washington. The moment Obama said, what you're doing is disgraceful, he packs up and he says, we're ending the ground war. They had the power to stop him. But they didn't exercise it. Now, you asked me about the human rights organizations. Can we just yeah. take one second break? We have 10 minutes more. I'll just scan through these and we'll come oh, with, with, yeah. with, uh, with the human rights organizations. I start with the bombers. No, no, that's okay. Yeah. Um, as you said, the immense firepower. This is an independent analysis of what the Israelis actually bombed Gaza with in 2014. Uh, it's more than 500% more than they did during Operation Casket. Um, 19,000 high explosive uh, artillery shells in addition to hundreds of the one ton bombs. Let's just be clear about the figure. 19,000, the figure I use is 20,000, it's not important. 20,000 high explosive artillery shells, 90% of which, 90% targeted civilian areas, 90%. Now, it's an interesting fact, because everyone talks about those 5,000 Hamas rockets, and they talk about the 2,000 Hamas mortar shells. Altogether, that's 7,000, right? And we hear about Hamas war crimes. These weapons are indiscriminate. They're targeting civilians. Let's leave everything else aside. Let's leave aside the one-ton bombs that were dropped in civilian neighborhoods, the two-ton drop bombs that were dropped in civilian neighborhoods, the 100 and more, 100 and more, one-ton bombs were dropped just on Shujaya, one of the most densely populated neighborhoods in densely populated Gaza. Let's leave all of that aside. More just the indiscriminate 
high explosive artillery shells were dropped in civilian neighborhoods, then all the Hamas rockets and all the Hamas mortar shells. But everybody remembers the rockets and everyone remembers the mortars, but I dare say there isn't one person in the room. I have to look for it. I dare say there's not one person in the room who knew that besides everything else, they fired 20,000 indiscriminate, high-explosive artillery shells, 90% of those 20,000 were directed in civilian neighborhoods. And if we look at the picture uh, as you just described it, this is an aerial uh, satellite photo of Gaza City in the north of Gaza with 600,000 inhabitants. And you see these uh, uh, colored squares that are destroyed buildings. You said one Israeli building was destroyed. In one Gaza, house. One house. In, no Ga in Gaza City alone, 3,500 buildings destroyed and 1,570 impact craters. That's only in Gaza alone. This indiscriminate, indiscriminate uh, bombardment, by the way, the Israeli generals and Netanyahu and Shimon Peres during Kaslet said that, quote unquote, 90% of our missiles hit the intended target. 90% of our missiles hit the intended target. These are high precision weapons, the drones, the artillery shells, everything is extremely sophisticated. 220 hospitals, uh, schools were damaged, 62 hospitals and clinics, 170 mosques, um, and you see the numbers of uh, uh, apartment buildings and houses destroyed by this Israeli bombardment. I want to just say a word about the houses. Because the houses is actually the most painful aspect of this painful story. 18,000 homes, 18,000 were destroyed during Operation Protective Edge. During cast lead, it was 6,300. It was almost three times as many. When I say destroyed, I mean rendered uninhabitable, gone. There were many more that were damaged. We're talking about gone, or rendered completely uninhabitable. Now, when you read the Amnesty International report, they have a report, it's called Families Under the Rubble. And it describes the destruction of homes in Gaza. And when you read the report, they say yes, Israel used disproportionate force. Yes, Israel used indiscriminate force. But they say our, our um, investigation leads us to conclude that maybe there were some Hamas militants in those houses. So they were targeting a military objective, a combatant. And it seems plausible what they say. But there's one problem, and the problem is easy enough for everybody in this room who has sufficient interest and sufficient motivation to investigate for themselves. Go to your computers and download the report Breaking the Silence on Operation Protective Edge. Now, Breaking the Silence has what you might call an unimpeachable source. You can't doubt it. It's Israeli soldiers who were fighting in Gaza. And they describe what they observed. And when you read their testimonies, and it doesn't take you long, it takes you the equivalent of how much time you spend on your Facebook each day, you know. Pull yourself away from it. I know you'll go into withdrawal, but go and pull yourself and read the report. It's 110 pages, big font, big spaces. So, and, and testimony after testimony. The Israelis show no remorse, no contrition. They're not embarrassed, they're not ashamed. They just describe, this is what happened. So what do they describe happened? 
They describe, we go into an area, we rope off the area, we send in what are called the D9s, the bulldozers, and they describe, I'm quoting them now, the bulldozer goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, demolishing one house, then a street, then a street. They say 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just going back and forth, demolishing the homes. There are no militants in the homes. Are you going to tell me there were 18,000 Hamas militants in those 18,000 homes? There was no fear. Nobody was trying to protect themselves. The houses were just systematically, methodically raised to the ground, destroyed. I don't have to tell anybody in the first rows who I suspect are Palestinians and maybe from Gaza what it means to lose your home. When I'm working on my computer and I click, press the wrong button, I have no idea computers, I can boot up, that's about it. I lose two hours work on my computer. I feel like, oh my God, the world has just come crashing in. Two hours of my genius has just vanished into cyberspace. You know, it's like the Holocaust all over again. I've lost two hours of my work. How could I have been so cursed? There is no God, right? And I suspect that's most of us. Well, what does it mean? 70% of the people of Gaza, they lost their homeland, their refugees. And now, in that proverbial blink of the eye, they lost their homes. It's the only thing they have left, their home. Every memento, every memory, their computer with the pictures on it, their identifications, a child's doll, everything, it's gone. 18,000 homes. And then along comes Amnesty International, and in a shameless, a shameless, shameful fabrication, pretends as if there was a military target. Maybe Israel overdid it, but there was a military target. There was a Hamas militant. That's not what happened. How do I know that's not what happened? Because that's what every Israeli soldier described. When I was writing the book, I collected literally 10 pages of testimony of how the homes were systematically, methodically destroyed. I didn't know what to do with it. I wrote five of my friends and I said, can you just give me the best ones? And as Mass will attest, it still ended up three and a half pages of the book just repeating the testimonies. That's how the houses were destroyed. And that's why the human rights reports were so shameful in what they did. I am not gleeful about it. I know Matt's managed to get through the first chapters of the book. It's a long book and it's... I'm it gets, oh, um, the first four chapters are an Operation Cast Lead. And I'm, I'm sure he'll attest I depended entirely on the human rights supports. And then the question is, what happened? Why this betrayal? Can I, can I just, before we stop now and take a break, just give the backdrop. Now we talked about the buildings and the destruction of hospitals, homes, uh, mosques. Uh, let's just repeat the, the, the human tolls. And these are again from UN, from UN sources. On the Israeli side, there were 71 killed. 
out of which 66 were soldiers, four were civilians, one was a child. On the Palestinian side, there were 1,473 uh, civilians, uh, and these numbers have been updated. Um, at least 70% of the fatalities uh, on the Palestinian side were civilians, 8% were civilians on the Israeli side. Total 556 Palestinian children were killed in 51 days, 299 Palestinian women, um, and uh, uh, moreover, three and a half thousand Palestinian children were wounded, meaning 4,000 Palestinian children killed or wounded in 51 days. What would the world have said if 4,000 Israeli children had been killed or wounded in 50 days? The ratio, if we look at the fundamental question of protection of the civilians, if you calculate the numbers, for every Palestinian fighter that the Israeli army killed, they killed 5.3 civilian Palestinians. They killed five times more civilians than soldiers that they pretended to fight against. On the Palestinian side, for every Israeli soldier that they killed, you remember the number 67, the Palestinian killed 0.06 civilians. So leaving aside the protection of civilians, on the number side there is no doubt who protected the civilians. And the ratio of killed Israeli to killed Palestinian children is 1 to 556. So what happened from 2009 to 2014 that made Amnesty International not emphasize this grossly improportional and the responsibility of the Israeli army and the government? Well, here you enter the realm of speculation, and I always have to distinguish between speculation and fact. My impression is, after Operation Cast Lead, uh, it was a public relations disaster for Israel. Uh, large numbers of the broad public, which up until then were willing to give Israel the benefit of a doubt, after Operation Cast Lead, they turned against Israel. And one of the indications was what was called the Goldstone Report. The Goldstone Report was commissioned by the United Nations Human Rights Council. And Goldstone was a respected international jurist. He was and is Jewish and he was and is, by his own reckoning, his own account, he is a Zionist. He says it with pride. He sat on the board of directors of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. His daughter went to live in Israel. And so he was deeply identified with Israel. And then he produced a report one of four, but he was the head of the commission, a report which was totally devastating to Israel. It said, as I mentioned earlier, it concluded that Israel's goal was to humiliate, punish, and terrorize the civilian population. And so he kind of lifted the curtain of lies. He dispelled the fog of lies, because he was saying, this is not a military operation. He was not targeting a military adversary. It was targeting civilians. It was designed to terrorize the civilian population. Well, Israel became hysterical. A frenzy was whipped up in Israel. They were so outrage at Goldstone, not only because of what he said, because many other human rights organizations said roughly the same thing, but who was saying it? Could you believably allege that he's anti-Semitic? No, not Richard Goldstone. Could you believably 
allege that he's anti-Israel? Not Richard Goldstone. Not believable. Then if he's not anti-Semitic, and he's not anti-Israel, there's only one plausible explanation as to why he said what he said. And that one and only plausible explanation is because it was true. And Israel did not know what to do. It couldn't use its usual smears and slurs to discredit and undermine Goldstone. And they unleashed this very ugly, vicious campaign against him. Among other things, he was being denied the right to attend his grandson's bar mitzvah. He's South African. The Jewish community in South Africa, or elements of the leadership, were denying him the right to attend his grandson's bar mitzvah. The, when a, a Jewish child turns 13 and becomes technically a man in the religion. And on April 1st, 2011, which in the United States, I'm told also in Norway, is called April Fool's Day when you do pranks and jokes on other people. You open up the Washington Post and Richard Goldstone took everything back. He said, I was wrong. And he claimed that new information had become available that showed that Israel had not committed the crimes of which it was accused. I examined the evidence very carefully, and I can tell you for certain <laughs> You can examine it yourself. No new information became available. That's not a plausible explanation. And then the question is, if no new ex evidence became available, why did he do it? Some people speculate that the pressure finally got to him, and he took everything back. The technical term is he recanted took it back because the pressure got to him. I can't prove it, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that it wasn't the pressure that got to him. I think personally that he was blackmailed. Everybody has skeletons in their closet, things about which they're embarrassed, ashamed, or don't want to become public. And even if you don't have skeletons in your closet, somebody close to you does. And I think that the Israeli uh, security found some, let's call it, compromising information, and Goldstone gave in. And I think for the human rights community, that was a very sobering moment because they think, if I do what Goldstone did, I might be next. And so a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of it was a fear of being Goldstone, of facing the same fate as him. And others, I had a long, and I found it, informative conversation with Matz yesterday because another person who recanted was the editor of the British medical journal called The Lancet, which is the most respected medical journal in the English language. And they had published during Operation Protective Edge an open letter signed among others by Matz, in which they denounced the Israeli crimes in Gaza during Protective Edge. And then he came under a horrific attack 
by Israel and its supporters. And by the end, at the beginning, he withstood. He stood his ground. But by the end, he makes a trip to Israel and he starts singing the praises of Israel as a beautiful example of how Arabs and Jews can get along. And he says, I will never, he said, publish a letter like that again. And I'm not sure I'm going to use, let Matt use his discretion because I'm not sure what you said yesterday is for public consumption. But Matt presented a moral dilemma that the editor Richard Horton confronted. And if you feel you can make it public, and I'll just remind you the obvious, there's a camera there, mm -hmm. and the editor is a friend of yours, I take it, you can discuss. There was a moral dilemma. Um, unless we go into uh, a little bit deeper discussion on that issue, um, I, we might have it for the discussion. I think we will round up the main presentation now. Uh, but I will, uh, uh, before we go for break, I want to underline that both for Norman and me, uh, d despite the fact that we talk a lot about numbers, we know, as you so beautifully described the loss of a home, these are human beings. And um, our books will be available now in the break, we will sign them. And I'll just put up one picture uh, of one of the many patients that I participated in the treatment of. I am no hero. The heroes are the Palestinian doctors, nurses, ambulance paramedics, medical students, and civilians who stood their call during the attacks night and day and who are, as we are speaking, still doing their extreme efforts to serve their people and their sick and needing ones. This little girl from Sashaya attack, had a deep cut in her left thigh. She needed anesthesia. She was cold, she was without her parents, and she was one of the three and a half thousand injured Palestinian children during the 51 days of protective edge. I will spare you the images of the headless, the mutilated, the amputated, 556 killed children. But uh, we leave it here for the break. I want to just, uh, you know, I have an opportunity. There are a lot of people here. Most of you will not have the time or the patience to read through the book. And I, I want just some of the facts. Because you see a child and you think to yourself, well, war victim. Terrible, but that's what happens in war. But is that the full story? The human rights reports have many accounts. Remember, Israel was using these drone missiles. A drone missile attack, the person on the ground, he or she not only controls the delivery system, but once the missile leaves the delivery system, they still can see from the cameras on the missiles as it approaches the target. And up until the last minute, the person on the ground can divert the missile from the target. Now these are very sophisticated optical equipment. From a far distance they can see the colors and the design on your clothes. It's very impressive optical technology. And over and over again, you find in the human rights reports from Cast Lead and from Operation Protective Edge, there are children playing on a roof. There is no military fighting or target in the vicinity as reported by Israel. And the missiles are homing in on the target, children playing 
on the roof, and up until the last minute, they had the capacity to divert the missile from the target. The kids were killed. Now, I am not happy to say that. And I know how ugly and vicious it is to indict those Israeli perpetrators. I'm not comfortable doing it, but it's a fact. It's a fact that's over and over and over again documented. And I have to say, and I'm not happy to say it, it's because of the cowardice of so much of the international community, and now, along with the human rights organizations, that they get away with it. Yesterday night, somebody asked the question, why is Israel so sensitive to public opinion? I said, that's a... It's a good question, but there's also an important point apart from the question. They are sensitive to public opinion. They are. That's why they invest so much money in trying to control and spin public opinion. And that tells you, if we told the truth, if we said what's really happening, they wouldn't do it. It's because of the cowardice and the silence. They know they can get away with it. If it were broadcast loud and clear, these kids are not victims of collateral damage or the fog of war. These were drone missiles homing in on kids playing on the roof until the last second the missiles could have been diverted but they were killed. That's the truth. Norman Wittgenstein. change of plans. We will be flexible. We have to distract the enemy. So we will not have a break. We will proceed directly to the questions from the audience or comments. We will continue until 8.15, which means another 15 minutes. Then you will go out and sign up for membership in the Palestine Committee and we will go out and sign the books. So, uh, the floor is yours, there are microphones, please uh, post your questions, uh, share your comments. I wonder uh, if I can request, the people were very patient this evening, and to your credit as an audience, I didn't see anyone texting, no. and that's a credit to you. However, I had a lot of very harsh things to say, and there may be some people in the audience who found it very painful. So for those of you who strongly disagree and were very kind in listening, even as it may have anguished you, I hope some of the dissenters will find the courage to come up and question me and ask me, is that true? I don't believe you. What's your evidence? And let's have an honest, free, open, truthful discussion. Thank you, Norman. And the floor is yours. Yeah. Um, and if I could just please ask um, people who raise their hands to ask questions and not to give long comments. And please state your name first, and then if you feel that you have a very relevant affiliation, um, you may also give that. Uh, I can already see some hands in the air. Um, so, um, there's one there. There's one there. There's one here. 
Yeah. And, and we're going to take three questions first, and then we'll give uh, some time for replies from Norman. Are you hearing me? Yes. Uh, I just wonder what you yeah, think. We, we'd like to have a presentation. Oh, you my name is Cindy Pop. I'm a member of the Palestine Committee of Norway. Um, I wonder what you think is the Israeli long-term plan for Gaza. What do you think they have in mind? What do they want to do with the local population? As simple as that. Or difficult. And then we have a question in the back. Hello, my name is Sami Sari from Lebanon. The big issue about criminality is the establishment of Israel. Because Israel was found in 1948. They don't own the country. They kick out the people, they kill a lot of them, and they steal the country. That's the big issue we should start to tell people how Israel exists. Thank you for your all explanation about the criminality of Gaza or uh, West Britain, but the people in Gaza, they been kicked out from their houses in 1948, first, not first time in Gaza. Question is Israel, has Israel right to be there or not? One more before Norman has the, the floor. Thank you. Uh, my name is August, and uh, I'm a member of the parliamentary system of the University of Oslo. And uh, my question goes mainly to Norman Finkelstein. Uh, so I'd like uh, much to uh, give an answer as well. And uh, that is, do you support the academic boycott of Israel? Thank you. I, th I think we'll have time for replies now, and then some more questions. Um, so you'd like me to start now? I'm not sure who's speaking right now. Uh, you can start. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is, as you put it, a simple but obviously uh, a fundamental question. What is Israel's long-term plan for Gaza? Uh, I think that Mr. Netanyahu He's a pretty conventional politician, which is to say he doesn't have long-term plans. He exploits opportunities. Right now, he thinks he has a big opportunity because Trump is in the White House. And what he's trying now to do is, so to speak, solve the Israel-Palestine conflict in a bilateral agreement with Trump. So for those of you who are familiar with the technical terms of the Israel-Palestine conflict, there's what's called the final status issues. The issues that are supposed to be very complicated and are critical to resolve in the conflict. And the four final status issues are settlements, Jerusalem, borders, and refugees. So a few weeks ago, Mr. Netanyahu and uh, Trump decided to resolve the Jerusalem question. They said, Trump said Jerusalem belongs to Israel. He said it's off the table. And for Mr. Netanyahu, that was a big victory. One of the four final status issues has been resolved. The President of the United States says it belongs to Israel, it's off the table. Now, with Gaza, they're aiming at that second issue, the refugees. The reason they're cutting the money 
to UNRWA is they want to shut down UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, because UNRWA is the main institutional embodiment of the refugee question. They register the refugees. They validate the status of the refugees. If you shut down UNRWA, in fundamental ways, you are eliminating the refugee status of the Palestinians. And so they're now turning the screws on UNRWA to try to eliminate it. And that has been a long-term plan as in Israel. Israel has wanted to get rid of UNRWA, not because UNRWA is supplying humanitarian assistance, but because UNRWA validates the status of the refugees. So, the long, I don't think there is a long-term plan. There are, t there are taking advantage of moments. And so right now, they would like to eliminate UNRWA and probably also using this as another occasion to try to get uh, Hamas to completely capitulate and enable the Palestinian collaborators in the West Bank to take over control of, uh, of Gaza. But we have to bear in mind it has nothing to do with Gaza's, Hamas's existential threat to Israel, which is laughable. It's they only want collaborators in the occupied territories. And Hamas has not yet officially reduced itself to that status, although objectively it's been forced into that status. Namely, it has to police Gaza so as not to provide Israel with another pretext to attack. So it's effectively objectively, and I'm not faulting it, it's just the circumstances, it's now acting as Israel's police in Gaza, but it's not yet collaborators, and that's what Israel would like. So I don't think they have a long-term plan. If you know the history of the Zionist movement, they never had long-term plans. They always waited for what were called miracles. So they didn't know First of all, how are we going to establish a state in Palestine? We have no army. We don't have money because most of the original Zionists were poor. Their main constituency was Jews living in shtetls in Eastern Europe. We don't have money. And then they got what was called the miracle of the Balfour Declaration. They got a major imperial power to back them. Then, in 1947, they had another miracle. The Cold War had begun already by 47, and they got the United States and the Soviet Union, the two adversaries in the Cold War, to agree on partition. Then, in the 1970s, they had a new problem. Or I should say, once they had the miracle of the partition resolution, they had a big problem. Nearly half the population of the state of Israel, as it was demarcated in the map, consisted of Palestinian Arabs. So then, what do you do? Well, they had another miracle. They called it the miraculous clearing of the land. That is to say, they exploited the opportunity of a war situation to clear out the Arabs from the, what became the state of Israel, and they became the refugees. Then in the 1970s, they had a new problem. The Arab population was growing very rapidly in Israel, and once again they worried about what they called the demographic threat. And then a new miracle came along. You know what the miracle was called? The miracle of Russian Jewry. One million Russian Jews came to Israel and restored the Jewish supermajority, even if, as technicality, 
about 40% of those Russian Jews were not even Jewish, but we'll leave that aside. And so the Israeli politic has always been one of waiting for opportunities, exploiting them, and then hoping for that miracle. So I don't think they have a long-term plan. They wait. They wait patiently for the opportunity. And right now, they have the opportunity with Trump in the White House of inflicting major defeats on the Palestinians. Uh, it's maybe possible they'll force UNRWA to fold. I don't think so, but it's possible. Um, so I think that's what they're up to. Okay. Uh -huh. We have five more minutes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, uh, this is uh, the crossroad between uh, a unique lecture and an engaged discussion. I love it. Um, do you have uh, more of your... I have two more questions. Yeah, so if you can, if you can cut it a little bit shorter. Uh -huh. That would be nice. <laughs> He's trying to be polite. <laughs> He doesn't understand, even for a former professor, it takes 15 minutes to clear his throat. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to risk alienating the audience at the end, and I hope you will bear with me that honest people have the right to disagree. Uh, there was a question put by a gentleman in the back of the room who identified himself as Lebanese. And I can certainly understand, as a person from Lebanon, the kind of loathing and hatred that he must harbor for the state of Israel. And even Syed Nasrallah, the head of the Hezbollah, who is an extremely sharp, shrewd, perceptive political anal analyst. Uh, whether you agree with him or not, it's impossible to deny his moral seriousness and his intelligence. Uh, when he starts talking about Israel, the language gets so filled with hate. It's a kind of language that he'll, he doesn't even use for the United States. He does not. And part of me, I kind of understand, I'm sure he would never acknowledge it, and it's his right not to acknowledge a personal tragedy, but he lost his son uh, to the Israelis, and anybody who has had to bear witness to the horror Israel has inflicted on Lebanon, just to take the case of 2006, in the last 72 hours of that 34-day war, in the last 72 hours when the war was over, our ceasefire resolution had been signed and they were just waiting to implement it. When the war was over, Israel dropped up to 4.6 million, 4.6 million cluster bomblets on South Lebanon, saturating it. Whole villages, if you read the descriptions, read Human Rights Watch's report, flooding South Lebanon, entire villages, it was like out of a science fiction movie, just saturated with the cluster bomblets. And so, when you, you or Nasrallah, when he talks about destroying, eliminating that cancer, uh, Israel, I can understand it. I can understand it. And I'm not going to pretend to be above human emotions. Because I remember well how my parents spoke about Germans. And it was not nice. No, it was not nice. And I had, it was hard for me to listen to sometimes. It was hard for me to listen to, but I understood it. I understood it. But I have to say, and here we will perhaps disagree, I'm old enough to see 
I'm 64 years old. I passed my life through a lot of history. And I've been old enough to see that people change, countries change, nations change, states change. In the first half of the 20th century, it's fair to say, I think, that the most racist and imperialist countries on earth, not to excuse the British, not to excuse the French or the Americans, but I think it's fair to say the most racist and imperialist were Germany and Japan. Japan, people often forget, it killed about 25 million Chinese during World War II. Germany killed about 30 million Russians during World War II. Very ugly places. But if you look at the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, it periodically does surveys. Which countries are the most peaceful on earth? Which countries are the most peaceful on earth? And almost every year at the top of the list is Germany and Japan. Germany and Japan. Now, it took a very big military defeat of Germany and Japan to sober them up. With all due respect to Norway, by far and away, the most morally serious young people in Europe are the Germans. There's no comparison with anyone else, especially when you start talking about issues of war or racism. People change, nations change, states change. I grew up, I grew up with black people being lynched in large parts of the U.S. Don't think for a moment that lynchings occurred in the dark of night when the Ku Klux Klan came down in white robes. That's not what happened. A lynching was a town event. Factory workers were let out early. Mothers packed the, crisp, the picnic basket. Children were let out from school early. An African American was lynched. And then after he was lynched, they would auction off the body parts. Somebody would buy a heart. Somebody would buy a kidney. Somebody would buy another body part, and then they would send postcards of them standing next to the body parts. That was what my country was like. Lo and behold, in my lifetime, we elected an African-American president. People change. Countries change. States change. So, I won't directly answer your question, but I think you get my point. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, I'm just going to uh, wind up uh, on that very positive note, on that positive outlook on history. Uh, I would like to thank you, Norman, for your contribution to the Solidarity Movement in Norway, to enlightening us and to putting so much work and efforts into uh, telling the truth. I have two gifts for you that I bought in Palestine. I want to just, I want to do two things. No, 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 no. I want to thank the audience. Yeah. I've had many audiences in my day. And always, after the main presentation, approximately one third leave because questions and answers start. Here, you can look around you. There are like 10 empty seats. So it's a real credit to you. It's a credit to and, you, sir. And secondly, There will be people in Gaza who will watch this. So how about everybody stand up with me. A round of applause for the people of Gaza.
like your dad in Arabic. Gasa Gasa Hatan Asada. Two gifts from Palestine. I bought it when I was down there just now to, because I knew I was going to meet you. This is a calendar. The future is bright. Uh, it's made by the educational bookshop in Jerusalem, in Al Quds, by this fantastic bookshop. And it is a calendar uh, uh, celebrating 12 important Palestinian writers. Just as you, yourself, you are such an important writer. And this can inspire you every day. And then, when you're working hard and you're not drinking coffee, but maybe a cup of tea, a brand new cup, also from Palestine, uh, from the educational bookshop, and it says Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. Here's the of thanking you both for a very interesting um, talk and I think I'm saying thank you on behalf of all of the audience who've been sat quietly, attentively listening to me. And um, if anyone would like to read uh, Norman's book or um, Mutt's book, they're for sale out in the lobby. There you can also find uh, T-shirts and uh, tote bags, and you can also become a member of the Palestine Committee. You have, you, oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> you're not allowed to leave without showing your membership card, so <laughs> might as well just get it done. Um, and also, as a small token of our appreciation, we of course um, will give you um, the tote bag from the Palestine Committee, um, and then also a T-shirt that says "Straight Out of Palestine." So thank you ever so much, and please, another round of applause.